Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Pastor Din Basundial. I'm based here in Orlando, Florida. I am the founder of a ministry called Dunamis Awakening, which is a 420 fire ministry church based on 1 Corinthians 420, which is, for the kingdom of God is not in, in talk or words, but in power, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Dunamis is actually the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, and that's a gift that um, gratefully the Lord has bestowed on me. I've been to just a little background real quickly. Um, I work as an evangelist, apart from being a pastor and minister. I've been to Africa um, a couple different times, um, preaching the gospel. I work as a level two trauma chaplain. So when Karen's story came to light and what happened in her life, um, it really resonated with me, and I decided I wanted to, to follow her life a little bit more closely and just be involved because she processed this in a way that not many are able to articulate. And not only doing that, but I think there was a lot of therapeutic benefits in terms of committing pen to paper, even though it was painful at times, I'm sure, right? And you look at her books, from, from lion to lamb, talking about her making that shift from the world that she lived in, the career, the secular, if you will, into something more of a lamb, into more of, well, why am I really here? What, what did God put me on this earth for? Are better days in my life behind me? Or do I still look ahead? And then you look at her second book in terms of recovery, uh, and not just telling her story, but what she's doing about coming back. And then thirdly, with this book, I, I felt it, it really is coming full circle because now it's giving back. It's giving back to the community and that it's allowing other writers to get together, to, to give a voice to their lifestyle. And I think it's such a great um, effort, especially since it was inspired by another Caribbean writer, Michael Anthony, and his book, The Year in San Fernando. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the woman of the hour, Miss, Miss Karen Asgarelli. So Karen, welcome. Hey, thank and you, Jen. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so I, I'm glad you put it that way. You put it in, in, a, in ways that I couldn't put it. It's really, you captured that so perfectly. I didn't even think of my life in that way but you did so it really is moving from um i see it as this part of my life being a second chance at life in fact a completely new life a new life and in this new life it's all about transforming hurt into hope and that's what this book is all about yeah that's incredible and i, I think it, it it not only does that but because You've pulled in all of these other stories from, you're, you're, you're essentially weaving these stories together, right? And individually, it's almost like a chapter in a book because it speaks to somebody's life. But it, more than that, it speaks to their life circumstance. But then you take it in together collectively as a whole. And yes, it makes for a wonderful cozy day on a rainy day drinking some hot cocoa. It's a comfort to many, but it's also, I think, inspiring to a lot of folks that might be reading this. Because just as I saw your life and I saw how you're basically processing all of this in your writings, I think it will encourage the next generation coming up to really give voice to, to their lives and how it might speak to the future. So if there's one thing or a few things that are key to this book that you would like to share with the potential reader, what would that be? What's your hope for this book? So um, I'll share a few things with you. This book, the title Hot Cocoa on a Rainy Day, it's a bit unusual. It's a name, it's a title that will catch attention and be a conversation starter. But mm -hmm. it came about, as you said, because of the feelings that were created from a story that I read by Michael Anthony, the year in San Fernando. And the product, protagonist in that story 
he was trapped indoors on this particularly rainy day. And the smell of hot cocoa wafting into the living room as he stared out at the rain that was pouring torrentially. That feeling of comfort and security that he got is what I was trying to capture through the stories in this book. And essentially, all of these stories are stories that are, as you said, although they're individual stories, each one forming a chapter in the book, they've come together in a very, um, in a way that can really touch you, Din, because what, what the stories do when you read the book in its entirety, you realize that it brings together the culture of our people. It brings together community just by having different authors come together to write the story. Um, it shows us resilience and faith. Each one of the stories has a thread of faith running through them. And then there's the interconnectedness that we see in all the stories through some of them um, being set in Cocoa Estates, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a theme throughout. And that was, I didn't set out that way for it to, to be that way. I just chose the title Hot Cocoa on a Rainy Day because it was a, a, something that spoke to me. But when the stories were published, and I sat down and I read them all together in one. Then I realized, but wait, I have the first story about a cocoa farmer who's an entrepreneur. I have one of the stories at the back end about uh, Mr. Winston Dukaran, who was born in Rio Claro, which is where we have a lot of cocoa estates. And the first story was also set in Rio Claro. So right there we saw uh, a thread kind of weaving through the whole book. And then throughout, we, we saw where there were stories based in schools, there was church involved, we had things like different health challenges, but right throughout it, regardless of the circumstance, we found that faith, culture, and the resilience of our people were reflected in all of these stories. And so that's how we came up with the hot cocoa on a rainy day. And then the 10 plus one stories to warm your heart. So as I mentioned at the beginning, my objective is about transforming hurt into hope. So I wanted to provide for people a forum where they could share their stories. And in, in writing their stories, they would be able to take some of that hurt that they would have held inside of them for a long time and bring it out onto the paper and make it real and get rid of it from internally. Once it's out of here, then the rest of your life becomes easier to move forward. And not only that, but you, you offer um, to other people things to add to their toolkits for survival. Because you would have added how you coped, you would have added how you felt. And people could take from those stories and learn and add it, as I say, to their toolkits for resilience. Why 10 plus 1 stories? So what I was trying to do is to keep the 10 plus 1 key steps for building resilience. But what I realized was that um, to get to these 10 plus 1 stories, I would need to have 10 plus 1 stories. I would need to get authors to write these stories. But I also wanted to write some for myself. My initial intention was that I would be the plus 1 and I would have 10 authors. As it turns out, um, in doing my research, when I went to visit that cocoa farmer, Subita Maipu, her story was such a touching story. She had met so many challenges in her life. And in spite of all her challenges, or maybe because of all her challenges, she um, actually felt that no matter how far she progressed, she would always have to pull her people with her. She had no intention of just moving ahead by herself. So what I mean by that is that as a cocoa farmer, every time she learned something new to build her cocoa farming uh, company, what she did was she passed on that knowledge to others. So she didn't leave the others struggling by themselves, but she always tried to help everybody else. So her story was together we are powerful. Mm -hmm. So um, when I, when I, after meeting her and talking to her and coming across this great story that was all about cocoa and hot cocoa and chocolate and everything that has to do with the book, there was no way I could have just written the plus one story. I had to write two of the stories. So what it meant was that I had to get just about nine other authors to come along with me. And so that's how I got my 10 plus one and having my 10 plus one stories then I could have decided on the length of each story because I knew how long I wanted the book to be. So 
those are some of my thoughts on it then okay yeah. well that's great because i think i learned going through the book i learned so much about the cocoa industry that i didn't even know you know i live in florida in the united states our drink here is coffee you go to the united kingdom um it's tea you go to india it's chai tea but in trinidad that's something that's very special to us it's cocoa or what we call cocoa tea you know and um for me it stirs memories of of, of love it's like basically a cup of drinking a, a cup of love you know yeah. and you think about the coziness of being sheltered inside of a, a home when you hear the sound of the rain coming down it paints a lovely picture so i couldn't think of anyone more uh fitting to get do justice to this than you karen but my question is this i mean you're basically extracting and maybe that's not the right word because that sounds painful right but i'm sure you must have had a few um diamonds in the rough where maybe they didn't want to share this story how were you able to convince some of these authors to to do that just that well, that's really an interesting question Jin, because um i don't know if i had mentioned this but i have started working on the next edition of the book and this particular one that i'm working on is a cancer journey and i'm working with uh, cancer survivors mainly and the thing about it is that um, they asked a very same question some of them were concerned about the writing now in this first book um there were a couple of people who did not want to write their stories and what i did was i i did my very best to provide them with as much support as i possibly could so what i did was i made it clear number one if you don't wish for your name to be used you don't want people to read the story and know that this is you you can use a pseudonym and you can change the names in the story as well so although it will be a true story you don't necessarily have to use the correct names so that was one option they had and that actually um was good for one of the stories uh, i don't want to identify with story but it was good for that one writer but then right. i still had a few others to um to try to help them through so what i did was i kind of offered um if they tell me the story i can write it for them not that i'm a great writer but um because maybe i have a little more confidence in terms of having written already you know it's not much more to write something else i'm not afraid if it's not the best writing you know I, i'll put it out there and we have editors so i told them that as well so they had options number one would have been to write under a pseudonym number two would have been that i would write it for you which didn't happen and number three would be where you write it and i get people to edit it including myself and polish it up for you so that you just give me a basic idea and we fill it in from there so um one person in particular and this was a story on getting things off my chest by lynette sinanan was very eager to get the story out but um didn't cater for the emotions that would come with it so that what happened was that, that particular author needed a little extra support so you know in the difficult emotional times i had to make sure that i was there for that person um not necessarily physically all the time but you know just to, to lend a um, listening ear so um basically i think when you're dealing with people who have been through difficult times and who are trying especially with reflective writing and they're trying to put their thoughts onto paper all you have to do is give them the patience and the love and the support and they'll respond and for the potential readers out there uh i can tell you lynette's story is very very powerful um it's going to speak to you and maybe resonate with a lot more of you those that have been dealing with illness in your family and maybe even something you've seen with uh, close friends or relatives but it gives you a bird's eye view dead center of what that's like and how it impacts family and um i thought that was a very very powerful story um i'm very grateful to karen because you know uh you you gave an offer to something that 
I hope you do again for the other uh, iteration of this book as it comes out, because I think a lot of the stories that we have are dying with, with generations where they're, maybe they're a lot more comfortable in an oral tradition where it's painful for them to put pen to paper, right? But they might still be willing to share something with you, maybe via an interview, and you could, you could get that type of information. And maybe I'm setting the stage for your next book. I don't know. But um, what you shared with me about, uh, you know, th this woman and growing up around Coco and how, um, you know, how much knowledge she just had to share. I mean, I thought that was really fitting that you would give her, you know, some, some real estate in this book because it was very, very telling. And it, it really set the stage for all the other stories, which I think is powerful. Yeah, you're correct. It did set the stage because, um, you know, there was so, so many elements and I think she has more, more to her story. Yeah? This was just a little isolated part that I focused on. I, I think that maybe in another edition, she may even write a story because she'd be more willing now that she's seen what um, the power of the words. Now she's maybe encouraged to um, put the rest of her story into writing because I think I mentioned vaguely maybe one line where she had a terrible childhood. So mm -hmm. she always imagined that her life started off on the wrong foot, almost slipping out onto the ground as she was born. So, you know, she really does have a lot to share for us. And um, in terms of uh, tying the stories together, you know, it never was my intention to write a story on the cocoa industry. But once I got into the cocoa industry and I realized that, you know, in Trinidad, we had this flourishing co cocoa industry at one point in time. And then because of the diseases that uh, attacked the cocoa itself, we found that our, apart from other things too, we found that the cocoa industry started to decline. Our cocoa in Trinidad is probably one of the most flavorful ones, the Trinitario cocoa. And it's described as having a fine flavor. And you may have remembered in the introduction somewhere I spoke about that where there's such a parallel between the cocoa industry and how we process cocoa mm -hmm. and, and compare it to our own lives when we go through trauma because in the same way we have to ferment and sweat the cocoa to bring out the full flavor, we also have to sweat through our trials and our trauma in order to bring out our full personalities, flavors and purpose in God. And you know, that's something I don't think that I've stressed enough in talking with you. But um, one of the things that I really wanted to come out strongly in these books, apart from the hope, was the faith. Every single one of our authors had to turn to God at some point in time in their story. If they hadn't done it before, when their incident happened, they had to turn to God. And the last story in the book, the one that was entitled Free Falling with God, and that's written by Mark Ramlal, who, by the way, is also a, a graphic designer who did the cover for our book. His story was really a touching story, a story that went, went straight to the heart because his story was about falling from the sky, so many thousands of feet way up in the sky, in paragliding, hitting the ground, getting up and walking away with barely a scratch. I mean, then, what else could have saved him but God? Amen. And Yeah, and what was powerful about that story was that he was willing to admit that God didn't save him for himself. God saved him so that he could demonstrate to one of his friends, one of Mark's friends, who happened to be an unbeliever. And it was to show this unbeliever, this is the power of God, and to bring him to God. And you know, I felt, both myself and Mr. Yamin Ali, who um, helped me edit the book, we both felt that was the story to end this book. That was the story that just brought it all together and hit home. What do you think about that? I think that's amazing because um, a lot of things, right? As a pastor, I could see the spiritual element and the dimension of that. Um, I could still only imagine what that 
that experience was like falling like that, probably thinking, you know, Lord help me, or this might be it, you know. Um, never once did I think this person was going to walk away from that. I thought, okay, this, it's maybe a, a paraplegic, and maybe he's talking from, from a hospital bed because he's paralyzed from the neck down. It could be so many things, right? But the fact that, that, that his life was preserved, and sometimes it's for the one, right? It's for the one individual that God would do something like that, to be able to speak into their lives and be able to show them, look, you know, I am not from just 2,000 years ago. It's not just about the Bible and what you read in the pages. It's me. I'm here today and I'm very, very real. And I think being able to use our testimonies, that's the term that we use a lot in church, right? Or what's your testimony? A testimony is, is, is Mark and what he was able to do in retelling the story um, and how, that, um, how God uses that experience to turn an, a non-believer into, well, wait a minute. I know just logically thinking this man shouldn't be alive today. But yet here he is. And not only is he alive, but he didn't get hurt in the way that we would think he would, falling as, as far as he did, right? Mm -hmm. And what I can't help but think is how many other souls are going to read the, this book and finish with that story and think, you know, if this, this person could do that and go through that and God's operating the lives of all these people, why not me? Yes, then definitely. And, um, you know, so that was just yeah, ending on that note, but throughout the book, it was building up to that. So for example, you know, we started off with a, a health challenge, somebody who has challenged multiple health challenges. And in spite of all those challenges and being in pain every single day, all she does is wake up and give thanks to God every morning, just for preserving her life just for letting her have a supportive family and a loving husband and child, you know? And then it went to somebody who would have experienced child abuse. Now you would think somebody who went through, she just described a little bit of what she went through. But for right. somebody who would have gone through something like that, you would think that this would be somebody who would walk around with a, a vendetta against people, you know, she, she wants to get back at everybody or she hates the world. But that's not the case with this person. If you meet this particular author, which you probably might, if you meet this particular author, you would be struck by her happiness. She seems to have a, a joy. It's an inner joy. It's a joy that could only come from knowing Christ or having that faith in your life. And then we went on to some others who had challenges in terms of their um, poverty and growing up. And perhaps that could be the spin-off to the next book that you spoke about because those stories, uh, two of those stories in particular spoke about the old time days. One spoke about dormitory days and at Naprima College and mm -hmm. having travel from Rio Claro and uh, mom, mom not, uh, parents not being wealthy enough to, to be able to send you to travel to school every day. So instead you had to stay at the school. Whereas one of the other stories spoke about um, you know, the, the long time scrubbing board and the chulha and, you know, going back to those days. So, you know, and, and in spite of not having, they all just said, God, they all admitted, well, this is what helped us through all of our difficult times. So, you know, it really built up to a climax with Mark's story. And one of the good thing, um, what's special about this book is apart from just sharing stories that can transform your hurt into hope and giving you all of this inspiration, this book really, um, it stimulates creative thinking and critical thinking. Because what it does at the end is it gives you a conclusion that starts you off, well, here are some of the lessons that you learn in the different stories, but I've only pulled out a few of the lessons and I left space in the book for you to write down the rest of the lessons that you would have learned from each one of the stories. And you know, then, if you were to get together with a few people and do that exercise, you'd be surprised that each person would come up with a different lesson that they learned from the stories. And um, so that's why I thought about the concept of having a book club as well to discuss this book. And in the book, right. I included the questions of, that you could use in a book club, or you could use it even on your own to help develop your thinking. 
So the book is unique in so many ways. Right, absolutely. And I, I meant to ask you about that next is the starter questions you came up with. Um, how did you come up with those questions? What, what types of um, thoughts are you looking to provoke with a potential book club reader that might, might get from some of these things, from these, uh, these uh, situations that you're posing? Right, so what I try to do is, um, I try to think for myself, you know, if you go into a book club, what you would ask about. And I was really stumped to be quite honest with you. <laughs> so um, I thought, okay, well, you know, right away you might want to know where the title came from. Um, you might want to know about the cover. What is, it, what is the symbolism on the cover? What does that stand for? You might want to mm -hmm. think about who is your favorite author. But I really didn't get very far with too many of the questions. So what I did, I did what everyone does in this mo in these modern times i went to google and i googled and i read and i read and i read and i read many different sites and from that i came up with ideas and that's how i got those started questions oh that's amazing Which I put in my um, my references there <laughs> yeah well what i like about this too is that each one of these are segmented i think we had that discussion with a previous author in a different interview, um, but together collectively, it tells its own story, but then individually, a book club could very easily focus on just one story and come back and then just revisit that from time and time again, because it, I mean, these stories are just so pregnant, so full of life with so much of what we're trying to capture. Um, so you, you have the legacy of, of the Caribbean experience, for one. You have the, the faith, F-A-I-T-H element, interwoven in all of it. You have the faith, F-A-T-E, and the experiences that they share that no doubt will resonate. You know, for me as a pastor, I think the story that spoke to me maybe the most was, was this man in, in Marbella and what he's been able to do for the young people. And, and Karen, I know you're going to tell me about that, but um, how did you find him, of all people? Tell, tell me about that story, if you could. So, um, I actually knew about him long before I even thought about asking him for this um, story. I had heard about him through a friend who was just telling me about this amazing person who has given all his salary and even his house and he's given up everything for other people in Marbella. And I used to hear about it and I always thought, well, you know, I'd like to meet this person one day, but I didn't really pay the attention I should have because for some reason it, it didn't hit me or maybe it just wasn't the right time. And then um, sometime later on after my incident, I thought about him. I think he reached out to me and he reached out to me at, a, at an event where I spoke and he introduced himself and he told me that he'd like for me to come and work together with him to talk to some of the women. He was looking to start a women's section in his uh, organization. Um, mm -hmm. I did go in a couple of times, so we do uh, collaborate. I go in and I speak to his uh, some of his workers. He has OJTs, which are which are on the drug trainees that they get from the government. So they come in and they work with him, and I go and I speak with them just to give them a little boost. And um, so it was through that interaction, and I thought that um, after doing Sabita's story, I told myself. I would like not just to support an entrepreneur, but I'd like to support an NGO. And mm -hmm. in thinking, it didn't take me very long to think about there was this NGO right here in Maravella, just about five minutes away from me. Why don't I focus on him instead? And I'd always known about him. So I contacted him and he was okay with it. He went through the story. He put his OJTs to work with me. I searched the internet and I wrote the story and that was it. Well, great. And I'd just like to add to that, um, just for the, the potential readers that are out there. Um, this is a story of a man that, that, that took whatever he had to take, both him and his wife, until his wife passed away. And now he's carrying on her legacy as well uh, for at-risk youth, uh, some of which have grown up to become international 
um, athletes, okay? And they've, they've made a name for themselves because somebody took the time to care. And when you speak to him, I'd like you to do me a favor because I was so moved by, by his story and his dedication that I would like to purchase 25 copies of this book as it's released for use in his centers so that it could speak to the next generation as it comes up. So please Jin, tell him my honor to do that. I will, I will make sure and tell him that and I know that his heart will be warmed by that gesture. Thank you so very much. Oh, it's my honor. So Karen, you've gone through a lot as we, we, we talked about in the beginning of our interview, right? Where you, you had a shocking reality check probably more so than most, but also more fortunate than most because many don't survive that tale. To now where you're looking to give back into the, into the community. But I, I, I guess what I'm asking and what I'm trying to get at is, it's almost as if the shoe's on the other foot, isn't it? Because instead of now you being the storyteller, now you're fostering that and giving platform, giving voice to other storytellers and bringing those folks up with you. What does that do to you as, as the person that made this happen? And how, how might that have affected your journey so far today? So then, um, one of the things I prayed about along this journey was that I would discover what my true purpose was. And I kind of was spinning top in mud for a while you know, um, like someone learning to swim, I was just kind of fluttering about in the waters. And it, it always struck me that I was supposed to play a supportive role. I just didn't know how that role would work out. I didn't know where I was going to do it. And um, when the thought of this book started, I realized that, you know, after meeting so many different people after my like if I did a speech at an event and people would want to share their stories with me or when I did workshops on writing and people wanted to write but they were afraid of putting things into writing and publishing it because they didn't want people to laugh at them or they felt that they didn't have enough to write or they felt that their story wasn't striking enough and it, I, it came to me that you know I could provide this forum for people I could help them to share their stories in a way that will impact a lot more people. And that was when I realized, you know, I think this may be what, I, what my purpose is about. Um, I started doing it and I feel convinced it is my purpose, but I'll tell you something then. Along the way, I've had to battle a lot of internal battles in the sense that, um, and today it was particularly pronounced. So um, our viewers may not know this, but at the beginning I told you that um, I really wasn't sure I wanted to do this today. Today I really was fighting a battle and I think it may have been a spiritual, apart from a mental battle too. And um, I, this is not about me. I think I'm just God's tool, he's just using me. Uh, I'm his instrument and through me um, these people have a place that they could put down their writing in, that they could immortalize their stories, that they could leave their legacies and more importantly that they could help other people. And the reason why I'm battling so much is that I've found that um, hot cocoa on a rainy day has been stalling. I really wanted to launch in July and for some reason the date keeps getting pushed back and I'm thinking that maybe maybe at some level although I'm not admitting it to myself maybe at some level um, I want to take the credit for having done it um, I haven't it's not mine to take really I'm just doing God's work and uh, that's where my battle came so you know you are right when you said that going along this journey has impacted me and that that's just one of the ways that it has and um i i really think that um my role is supportive help other people and by helping them of course it'll help me as well 
Thank I'm not sure if I answered your question there because no, I kind of got lost <laughs> somewhere. No, you did and then some. And mm -hmm. I would like to affirm that because, um, and you and I have talked about this, right? Yeah. This is probably um, after two other tries of sitting down together because life happens, right? Yeah. And there's always something that will get in the way. But if I could encourage you, Karen, I would say this. Um, I would say just thank you, devil. You know why? Because now you're proving to me that I'm doing the right thing because you're trying to get in the midst of it. So whenever I see delays, I smile and I say to myself, ah, this is why, right? So if I could encourage you, I would say, keep pressing on because it's his timing. It's not ours, the Lord's timing. And this will be released when it will be released despite the attacks of the enemy. And that's something that, you know, we live every day. So for the potential readers out there, I'd just like to share with you some of the, the life stories are titled, Together We Are Powerful, that's the Sabita story, uh, Battle Scars with, with Zaida, but there's also stories like Getting Things Off My Chest, Forged in Fire, The Internship, Triumph Th Through Trial, God Does Not Waste Pain, I really enjoyed that one. Perfidious Bounty, A Home Away From Home, Hearts of Gold, and then the plus one would be Free Falling with God. So the reason I'm sharing this to you as a potential reader is I want you to take from this the fact that this is our culture, hot cocoa, especially hot cocoa on a rainy day. We come, we come from a very rich life experience that is not diminished by what might be happening in other countries, you know? I, and I, Karen, you and I spoke about this before. You know, the United States might have coffee. England might have tea. Um, India might have chai tea. But we in Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, our life experience is hot cocoa or cocoa tea as I knew it growing up, right? And it always draws the, the feelings of warmth and of love and just just the title of the book I think is going to get people's attention and if I could encourage you I think that this is really just the launching pad think about this about the stories about the potential readers and about these priming questions that are designed not just for a book club but for the reader to go back introspectively and look at their own lives. You know, perhaps you looking at this right now will, will be one of the contributors for the second or third or fourth version of this book, where for many generations to come, your children and your children's children are going to read about your life experiences back then and the way it was. And I think that's powerful because I think if nothing else, we could impart to the next generation is our immortal thoughts and our ideals and our hopes and our fears and our desires and our belief and our faith in God. All of these things are important, but hearing it from us firsthand um, goes far, far beyond, you know, just, just the media telling a story and then they're off to the next thing. So I applaud what you're doing. And when the going gets tough, especially that's when you want to keep going, because that's the time where, you know, that saying goes, it's, it's always darkest before the dawn, you know, and I, I just would like to encourage you with that. I'd like to thank you for sharing your life with me and, and, and you know, some of what you're doing in this book. And I, I can't wait till it comes out. And in fact, hopefully when you're getting ready to launch this, just let me know. Hopefully by then they would have lifted the travel restrictions because I would love to come down and be a, be a part of that. Oh yes, I would love to have you here for that as well. Um, before we leave, I'd just like to, to share a little bit about how the book will be available and you know, just to promote oh, the yes, book a little okay. bit. So, um, Hot Cocoa on a Rainy Day, 10 plus one stories to warm your heart. This is an inspirational collection of stories um, that uh, will, will surprise you by the, the faith and interconnectedness and the resilience of the people in the stories. Um, the book is, it has a name that according to Din will be a conversation starter. 
And I think that anywhere in the world you go, although they may have their coffee and their tea and their chai tea, I think that everybody knows when it gets a little cold outside, when it gets a little rainy outside and inside, there's nothing as comforting as a cup of hot cocoa. And this book is, it's a great coffee table book that you can place in your living room, that you can have in your doctor's office, in your dentist's office, in a church office while people are waiting. It's a really great book. It makes a good gift. It's a, the, the, some of the stories are tear jerking stories, but at the end of it, you still emerge with a smile on your face because that's how every one of the heroes in my stories, that's how they emerge from their trials. So um, regardless of what your challenge might be, there is something in each one of the stories that will appeal to you because of your rainy day and because of their rainy day. And the book is available, it will be available on Amazon, as well as for those of you who are here locally in Trinidad, it will be available directly from me as well. And of course, you can place your pre-orders if you want. Amen. Well, well, Karen, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing with, with me a little bit more about what we could expect when this book comes out. Uh, thank you for the advanced um, uh, draft so I could at least relate a little bit to what the book entails. And um, like I said, you definitely don't want to miss this book. It's one that's going to speak to you and perhaps even more than one story at a time, you will see yourself and your life in these stories with, with being able to identify with it. And for that, I applaud your efforts. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Din. Thank you for doing these interviews with us. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. You, you, you're very professional, I must say. Thank you. All right. It's my pleasure. You take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.